So what we're going to focus on today is how someone meets the criteria to be tested. Generally, to be tested, someone must be considered a person under investigation or PUI. Now, each country is going to have different standards or criteria, and those criteria are likely to change as the situation evolves. Generally, as the disease becomes more widespread, the criteria to qualify for testing will be relaxed or broadened. We've seen that occur in places like Italy, and it looks like the U.S. is about to loosen its criteria. So let's look at the criteria that the U.S. CDC is currently recommending to use to classify someone as a PUI. There are two important considerations. First, the clinical features, and second, the epidemiological risk, or the context of the clinical features. What we see here are a couple of key points. First, clinically, a person must always present with a fever. The U.S. and most other countries are not going to test asymptomatic or mildly sick people. Yet, we do know that infected people can be asymptomatic, and asymptomatic people can transmit the disease. For example, over 600 people on the Diamond Princess cruise ship tested positive, yet half of them were asymptomatic. This is probably the best estimate of asymptomatic testing since all people on the ship were tested. It's most representative of the entire population. Even so, data out of China, which only sampled a smaller subset of people suspected of being uh, infected and primarily only consisting of severely ill patients, found more than 1% were asymptomatic. The other things we should see about the criteria for qualifying as a PUI is that the context is important. So if you're sick with a fever and a cough and we're in contact with someone positive with COVID-19, you should be tested. Now, the problem with this kind is kind of a knock-on effect. If you don't test many people, then it's not possible to have many people that are positive for the disease, so you don't know if you've been in contact with an infected person, patient. In many places, this criteria isn't going to be met because we haven't tested. I think this approach, which is built on the assumption that basically we know all the infected people, is what has led to delayed responses and widespread outbreaks in Iran and Italy. Next, if you're sick with a fever and cough and it's so bad that you need to be hospitalized and have a history of traveling to an infected area, then you should be tested. Again, the problem I see here is that we're only identifying severe cases. As has been shown in research, many people are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. Dr. Fauci in the U.S. said it's very clear that the people who are getting caught in that umbrella of reporting are the people that present themselves to a hospital. There's a Another whole cohort that is either asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. The problem is not that these people are at health risk for themselves. The problem is that these asymptomatic people will spread the disease undetected. Finally, we come to the third possible way to be tested by CDC standards. Here again, you see that you must be sick to the point of requiring hospitalization, but without another possible diagnosis. Uh, basically, you've been tested for the flu or other likely causes and they've come back negative. Again, waiting until we see extreme illness and waiting for uh, test results to come back is not a proactive way to screen for the disease. Since data from China has shown somewhere around 20% or less of cases are severe, then this criteria is going to possibly miss 80% or more cases if the disease begins spreading in new areas where it wasn't expected. Many countries uh, have started more widespread testing efforts, such as South Korea, which has pledged to test the 210,000 members of the religious cult at the center of the outbreak, and the UK has initialized a program to do at-home uh, in-community testing to reduce the need for patients to travel to secondary health facilities and place a strain on those facilities or possibly expose patients while in transit. So each country has their own criteria to qualify as a person under investigation and to be tested for the disease. So how many PUIs has Thailand identified since the start of the outbreak? Well, as of the 27th, Thailand has identified a cumulative total of nearly 2,500 PUIs, with 991 of them currently hospitalized. Of the 41 cumulative cases of COVID-19 that have been identified, 14 uh, are still in the hospital. Here in Thailand, the Ministry of Public Health uses a definition similar to what's being used in the U.S. and Canada. To be considered a PUI, you must have symptoms, including fever and cough, and have a recent travel history to Japan, Singapore, South Korea, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, or China. In addition to traveling abroad, patients with pneumonia in specific provinces can also be classified as PUI. But what I'll tell you is that there are a number of issues with this approach. First, it's the issues that I've raised before. 
only severe cases will be identified. And we know that maybe 80% of cases are not severe. And second, we know that the disease is spreading in more than just these at-risk countries. So any travel to Europe, for example, would not be flagged, even though many people are contracting the disease in Europe. The second issue has to do with compliance. We already know about the lion grandpa. If you don't go, if you don't, go and watch my last video about it. But if patients are not honest about their travel history, they will not be identified as a PUI. Going further, I've spoken with many doctors in Thailand. I've heard specific stories about how patients have come in with a fever, with a cough, and admitted to traveling to places like Japan, but have refused to be tested and gone home. I've also known of cases where doctors have opted to send a person back home without testing, telling that person to self-isolate because they basically don't want the diagnosis. The patient's condition was not serious enough uh, to have to isolate that person and admit the person to an infectious disease ward that would be viewed as an excessive, uh, given the mild nature of their symptoms. So another thing I've always wondered about is whether these PUIs have been tested. At first, there was quite a lag due to the limited diagnostic capacity of the country, but I think a lot has been done to expand the capacity and introduce the ability to test greater volumes. So I think the answer now is that most PUIs are being tested, and the test results can be returned within about a day or so. Another question is, does anyone that doesn't meet the criteria for PUI get tested? And the answer to that is yes. We've seen in recent days that anyone who comes into contact uh, with a confirmed positive patient will also be tested, such as the many people who came into contact with a lying grandpa. So it's like this. Most PUIs are tested, and there are some people that don't qualify as PUI based on the criteria that also get toasted. We don't have recent numbers on how many tests have been completed, but as of February 21st, 1,489 tests were reported to have been completed. At that time, 35 had come back positive, <clears throat> and that's a positivity rate of around 2.4%. This is fairly in line with other countries, depending on how wide a net they are casting to search for the virus. Now, there is a balance to all this. Six laboratories are authorized, and I think it's now up to seven, but there is a finite amount of resources available to complete these tests. So we don't want to overwhelm the system with unnecessary tests. And I know that the ministry is explicitly not making it possible to test at your own discretion, even if you would offer to pay for it. That said, this approach points to many people who could be positive. Uh, they won't be tested if they don't exhibit severe symptoms. So the bottom line, Thailand has established a protocol to qualify to be tested that is fairly in line with other countries that do not have community transmission, such as the U.S. or Canada. It's fairly limited and focused almost exclusively on severe cases or people who may have come into direct contact with confirmed cases. Overall, this is a balanced approach that tries to efficiently track the disease uh, without putting too much of a burden on the labs. However, it undoubtedly precludes identifying any asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic infections, which could make up to 25-50% or of actual infections. The risk to this approach is what has already happened in many countries, and that risk is that if the number of minimally symptomatic patients grows large enough and is not being identified and isolated, that cohort could become a significant source of new infections and it will go past a tipping point where it can no longer be contained. So now you know what a PUI is and how someone can qualify for testing. In my next video, I'll explain how someone can be diagnosed with COVID-19 and how our current diagnostics are limited. As always, thanks for watching. Like and subscribe so you can get the latest videos. Leave your comments below. Thanks for watching.